Uh, okay, I'm excited. Uh, welcome to my talk. Um, today I'm talking about building multilingual websites with Drupal. Uh, my name is Sam, I'm a developer at Cogap, which is a digital agency in Brighton. Um, I tend to work with arts and cultural organisations and third sector organisations as well. Um, so I'll just quickly go through what we're going to talk about. This has stopped working. Um, so, just give you a bit of context um, to this talk, uh, show you a few of the projects we've worked on, um, multilingual sites uh, in the last few years. Um, then I'm just going to kind of step back a bit and look at the broader question of why um, should we learn to build multilingual websites. Um, uh, then I'm going to look at what you get out of the box with Drupal, uh, Drupal 7 particularly. Um, if anyone's looked at multilingual stuff before, you might know about the um, kind of two main approaches, which are content translation and entity translation. Uh, I'll talk about the differences um, and why you might what, use one or the other. Um, go through a few useful modules, um, and then I'm going to talk about right to left scripts like Arabic and Hebrew, because uh, there are a few, quite a few gotchas um, when you're using those, uh, and some helpful things to know when you are uh, using those languages in a site. And then at the end, I'll quickly touch on Drupal 8 and what you can expect to see in terms of multi multilingual support uh, when that is released. Um, okay, so Cogap, uh, we've worked on a number of multilingual sites in the last few years, Drupal sites. Uh, the most recent that launched was the Qatar Digital Library. Uh, this was a project we worked on in partnership with the British Library. Um, they digitised, or well, they're in the process of finishing digitising uh, half a million records, um, and they worked with us to get those online. Um, it's available in English, but also in Arabic, and that's what the site looks like in Arabic. Uh, if I just go <coughs> back, if you have a look at the logo, it's on the right on the Arabic side, but it's on the left on the English side. Uh, the whole site flips from left to right, sorry, right to left, left to right to right to left. Um, and that is how Arabic readers will expect to see a website. We also work with Qatar Museums for a site that launched about a year ago. Um, it's their kind of umbrella organisation for all of their museums in the country. Again, this is available in English and in Arabic. Um, sometime last year, we also worked on the Kubla collection. Um, and a few months later, we then were required to trans provide the ability for them to translate it into Russian. So that's what Russian looks like. This time, a little bit easier because it's a left to right script. Uh, we also worked on the Relate uh, what's next site, which is kind of a guide to separation, um, which is also available in Welsh. Okay, uh, we also did built an app publisher which um, supported multiple languages, not just two, um, and Drupal supports as many languages as you can think of. Um, so why should we learn to build multilingual sites or why should we build them in the first place? Um, it seems kind of obvious, but it's worth going through. Um, there are more and more non-English speaking users on the web. Um, so if we go back to 1998, those heady days, uh, three quarters of web content was in English. Um, jump forward to now, and that's roughly 30% in English. So that's a massive increase in non-English content on the web. Um, in terms of Arabic users, um, again, a massive increase. Uh, it's out of the top 10 languages on the net, it's the fastest, it's had the fastest increase since the turn of the millennium. Um, in 2000, there were two and a half million users, and today that's approximately 135 million users. So that's a massive increase. Um, <coughs> that, In fact, that's an increase that's 10 times faster than the increase in English speakers online. Um, so 
if you look at my slides and slide share, you can see the stats just to make sure uh, I'm not making it up. Um, another reason to support multiple languages is language extinction. Um, <coughs> so 5% of the world's languages are represented online. That's a tiny proportion. Um, UNESCO uh, report believes that by the end of the century, half of the world's languages will be extinct, um, which is slightly terrifying. Although to put it into context, uh, half of the world's languages are spoken by around 10,000 people, which isn't many. Um, but it doesn't mean they're not worth saving. Uh, and just in general, a diverse web uh, is good for diversity and preventing cultural hegemony, inequality, that kind of thing. All reasons to support multiple languages online. Um, and there's a good book about multilingual support online. Okay, so in Drupal, uh, what do we have? So in core, we have the locale module. Uh, and this allows you to simply add languages to your site. Uh, it also allows you to translate the Drupal interface. Uh, this screenshot here, I'll show you a big one in a minute, um, is the interface for adding languages. That's the one for translating the interface. Um, it's also where you go and set how the language of the site gets detected and selected. Uh, there are various ways through the URL, either through URL path or a subdomain. Uh, it, it can also detect um, the user's language based on their browser settings. Um, if they're a registered user, it can detect it based on their user settings. Um, you can even set cookies, that kind of thing. So it's very flexible in how the initial language of the site is detected when the user first lands on the, on the website. Um, the URL format is also set in this module, um, so you can either have kind of the subdomain format or the path format. This is something you should choose early on, um, or you'll kind of if you change it halfway through, you'll have problems with URLs and links, that kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> that alone doesn't do very much for your site. Um, so this is just a larger uh, kind of image screenshot of where you add languages. There's a link there. You get to see kind of information and enable, disable. You also set default language of the site here. Again, you need to choose this early on, otherwise if you change it halfway through you'll face a lot of problems. Uh, and the basic reason is that Drupal kind of treats all of your content as if it has no language at all. Um, and when you start implementing multilingual site, you, you're kind of the one who's enforcing the fact that your content is in a language at all. Um, so you kind of have responsibility for these kinds of things. Um, this is the interface translation interface. Um, here you, you can search for a string. Uh, you can see whether or not it's got the translation in the language you're, you're looking for, uh, and you can add to translation. Um, annoyingly, it's case sensitive, so our translators had big problems with that. We had to find a way around for it. Um, you can also uh, import in bulk translations uh, within PO file format, and you can also export your translations um, and submit them back to the community, which is always a nice thing to do. Um, <coughs> I haven't actually mentioned it anywhere in these slides, but there's a module called Localization Update, which you can install, which will automatically uh, import translations for any module you install, if there are translations available out in the community. <coughs> <coughs> so that's really handy. Um, so all of the strings here uh, are ones that Drupal has picked up from the T function, which you've probably all seen around. Um, any interface text that you create, you need to wrap it in this function for it to be translatable at all. Um, but don't put variables in this function unless you do it in, in this format, where you you kind of set what you want to be replaced and then pass in an array of the variable to replace that string with. Um, it's quite simple once you start using it. 
you can also, there's a, a further uh, parameter for the T function, which is uh, options, and there you can include a context, which is under here. None of these have a context, but this means that you can have the same string translatable in, in different ways depending on its context. Uh, so you might have the word of, which in French you might translate differently depending on the context, depending on the infinitive verb that is preceding that kind of stuff. Um, so that's really handy. So this is the second multilingual module that's included in Core. It's called Content Translation. Um, it allows you to associate a node with a language. Um, so once you've set up a node to be translatable, you get a language field um, where the content editor can select which language it's in. Uh, it also allows you to relate node translations to each other. Um, so every translation of a node is a node in itself. You have the English version is its own node, the French version is its own node, the Arabic version is its own node, um, and with content translation you then link them together. So there are kind of two uh, methods for translating your content with Drupal. There's content translation, uh, which the module I just talked you through, and then there's entity translation. Um, <coughs> like I said before, there are various things that you have to decide early on, and this is a key one. You have to decide whether you're going to use content translation or entity translation fairly early on, otherwise if you change halfway through, you're in for a world of pain. So with content translation, uh, it's a core module in Drupal 6 and 7, but it doesn't exist in Drupal 8 whatsoever. Um, <coughs> I'll come to why in a minute. Uh, it allows you to translate nodes. Uh, I've said that already, it's a node in itself. Um, and a pro for content translation is that it's easier for your different language sites to differ. Um, for example, a menu you could include on the English site, um, node one, two, and three, which are all English nodes. And then on the Arabic side, you could include node four, five, and six, none of which are translations of node one, two, and three, if you see what I mean. When we come to entity translation, you'll see why that's kind of less possible. So there's uh, kind of greater flexibility with content translation in that way. Uh, and a massive downside is that only nodes are translatable. So when you're setting up content translation, um, you'll have installed languages, uh, enabled them uh, in the locale interface. Um, you then have to go to each content type that you want to be translatable and just go to the settings for that content type uh, and in publishing options there'll be a new section multilingual support. Um, three options, disabled, enabled and enabled with translation. Um, I mean there's no real reason not to pick enabled with translation because if you just pick enabled you can't link translations of nodes to each other you can only assign a language to a node. So it seems kind of pointless to me, but there may be reasons to use that. So you just set that and save, and that's pretty much it. Entity translation um, is a contrib module in Drupal 7, um, but it's only in beta. I don't know if there are plans to kind of bring it out of beta. Um, it's been in beta for quite a while, but it's in core in Drupal 8 which is really good. Um, it allows you to translate feel, fieldable entities, uh, which means that it extends far further than just nodes, it's, it's any entity. Uh, you can define which field can be translated. Um, so again, greater flexibility. And when you're using uh, that in code, um, you can use this array index, which <coughs> if you don't have a multilingual site, you'll be used to seeing language none in there pretty much everywhere. This harnesses uh, the use of that, that array index. 
so it actually has a, a, a function. Um, <coughs> Drupal gives you the language and language content globals. Um, language is the, the language that the site is currently being viewed in. Language content gives you information about the language that the piece of content you're viewing uh, is in, and there's a fundamental difference. Uh, it's quite complicated to get your head around at first, but once you have, uh, everything's okay. Um, if you use uh, entity metadata wrappers, um, the, the language of the value that you're pulling out is automatically um, assumed from the language global. So you don't have to go and say, I want this language version of it. It assumes it based on what the, your, the current user's language settings. So the upside is there's far more that can be translated. So taxonomy terms, um, <coughs> uh, comments, just basically any entity that you have set users. Uh, another upside is that it's completely supported in Drupal 8. That's the method that they went, they went for, and it makes sense. Um, the downside is if you're going to use it in Drupal 7, there are lots of issues with it. Um, the main two are that it's core search doesn't support it, um, and the other is that revisions aren't supported either. Um, <coughs> another downside, if you're using it in Drupal 7, um, is that unlike with content translation, uh, you have to have all of your translations ready before the piece of content can be translated. Um, so with content translation, you can create the English version uh, and publish it. Then you can create the French version and not have it published, uh, wait for the, uh, the translators to give you the translation and then publish it whenever you're ready. Uh, you can't do that with entity translation in Drupal 7 because, uh, because the translations are so much more tightly uh, tied together. Um, so with the sites that we built in the last couple of years, that would have been um, a bit of an issue because of the way that translations often come later. Um, yep, yeah, and another downside in Drupal 7 is you can't translate properties. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So just like with uh, content translation, you go to your content type settings um, and just enable a translation this time with field translation rather than with translation. Uh, you then go and set which fields you want to be translatable. Um, and it warns you that if your field's being used in different content types, they'll be available for translation in all of those content types, which is nice that it warns you that. So the fact that you can set which fields are translatable um, means that things are a lot more flexible. So here we've got a page which is uh, adding an Arabic translation of an English page that already exists. So uh, this content editor has already created an English page called My Blog Post. Um, they've already set uh, an image, some tags, and a body, some body text. And the Arabic translator comes in um, and they see which fields they can translate based on this, this suffix. Uh, so where it says all languages, um, the translator is aware that if they change that field, then the English version will also change. Um, any field that doesn't have all languages is available for the translator to edit. Um, so they've added the Arabic text into there. Um, <coughs> so I said before that properties aren't translatable. Um, and that's an issue with fields like this. So the image field here is the content is common across all translations. So this picture of a smiling dog will appear on English and Arabic and French and Spanish. Um, <coughs> but that means that the, the alt text that's attached to it will also be the same across all of the languages. So if you set an English alt text here, the Arabic site will have the English alt text that has all the French and Spanish sites. So that's a bit of a downside to entity translation. Again, you have, you have to basically roll your own fix for that. 
Um, but Drupal 8 deals with lots of these issues, which is good. Um, the Entity Translation module also comes with an admin interface where you can <coughs> determine which entities are translatable. So you've got, from a kind of standard Drupal install, you've got comment, node, taxonomy term, and user. Once you've enabled um, translation on an entity type, uh, you can then add extra settings on bundles that are attached to that entity type uh, down there. Um, it's quite cool. So yeah, like I said, choose a method and stick with it. Except if um, there are instances where you might want to use both. Uh, and a good example is Drupal Commerce. Um, so they provide their own entity types, uh, which you can't translate with content translation. Um, and you could feasibly install entity translation and make the Drupal Commerce entities translatable um, without making the node entities translatable. Uh, if you do that, it's a bit messy, but it's the only real way around it in, in Drupal 7. Um, <coughs> yeah, but just in general, any, any decision you have to make, uh, the URL format, um, type of translation, um, all those things you need to kind of decide quite early on. Okay, so <laughs> we've seen a few of the core modules Entity translation isn't the core module, it's a contract module, like I said. Um, really, to get anything like a full site translatable, there are lots of modules you have to install. Um, <coughs> there's the internationalization kind of set of modules, I18N, um, and there's, there's lots of helpful modules there which extend, particularly extend to content translation. Um, Uh, so you've got taxonomy translation module, uh, you've got multilingual blocks, multilingual variables, um, and there's loads more. There's uh, multilingual views. Um, <coughs> some of these overlap with what entity translation can do, uh, like taxonomy term translation, because that's an entity. Taxonomy term's an entity. Um, but if you install entity translation and any of the internationalization modules, they work together really well. Um, they don't conflict in any way because they're, they're basically built by the same people. So you don't have to worry about that. Another handy module is the localization client. Um, and this is really handy for translators. Um, the translation interface I showed you before uh, is, is slightly annoying because um, if you find parts of the site that aren't haven't been translated, you have to write them down, go into the admin interface, search for them, they come up. Whereas here you've got uh, an interface on, on screen where you can see terms that haven't been translated, um, search for them in here and then directly add a translation uh, and then save them to the database. You have to refresh the page for them to come up, but uh, it makes life a lot easier for, for content uh, translators. Um, so there are lots of gotchas when you're doing a multilingual site. Um, <coughs> I've talked about a few of them already, but there are more. Um, so I mentioned earlier the difference between the site language and the content language. <coughs> so the site language is how you see the whole interface. If you log into the, the back end and you see the admin menu, content structure, uh, all of that stuff, um, if it's in French, then French is the site language. Um, but if you go onto the front page and you see a piece of content that's in English uh, and the site language is in French, then it's the content language that is English. Um, again, you kind of have to <coughs> just do it and you get used to it. Um, something that quite a few of our multilingual sites um, asked for was the ability to edit language, uh, a content that's not in the same language as the site language. So they want, um, <coughs> let's say, Arabic translators to log onto the site, view the site in English, but edit Arabic content. 
um, that's quite hard to do so you don't get it out of the box um, and we had to kind of build workarounds for that so an example was entity references um, if you're editing Arabic content but viewing the site in English if you search for uh, in the entity reference field you'll get an English entity references um, which is not what you want you don't want references to English articles in an Arabic article um, and if you build a workaround for that uh, and then extend your content type with a different, a different type of widget you may then have to build another workaround for that new widget um, so yeah it's kind of another world of pain so if someone if a client asks you for that just say you can't do it <laughs> Which is what we should have said um, menu translation there are various methods for it um, none of them are perfect um, you just kind of have to find the one that's best for your site uh, find the issues with it and work around them again um, fonts uh, really vary on, on which characters they support, uh, particularly web fonts. Uh, so you need to, again, this is a thing you have to do very early on because <coughs> uh, when you get kind of halfway through a project, they've decided on all the branding fonts, that kind of stuff, and you say actually you don't have half of the characters you need to display your content, um, they then have to go and change their branding, you have to change their fonts, all of that stuff. So that's the first thing to check when they give you a font. Does it have all the characters you need in all of the font weights? Um, and a problem that I faced just last week was when a font appeared to support all of the different characters, but except for the SVG version, which didn't have some characters with diacritics in it. Um, and that was really annoying. So that's stuff you have to check right from the beginning. <clears throat> okay, so right to left scripts. So we built um, a couple of Arabic websites over the last couple of years, um, and this gave us good insight into some of the issues around supporting right to left scripts on the web. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few of those. <coughs> so it's probably obvious, but right to left scripts you read that way, left to right scripts you read that way. Um, So there are various languages that, that use right to left scripts. Uh, Arabic, Persian and Urdu all use the Arabic script, so they're all right to left. Uh, the Hebrew script, which is used in Hebrew and Yiddish, again right to left. Uh, the Tana script, which is used in Devehi, which is the language of the Maldives, right to left. And then quite a few ancient scripts, so if you ever have to support a site which is about um, ancient artefacts or ancient religions, you may come up across this. Um, so like Syriac, which is an Aramaic language. So we were dealing with Arabic. Um, the basic alphabet in Arabic is 28 characters, but there are, there are lots more. Um, uh, they tend to use Eastern Arabic numerals. Um, although they do sometimes use Western Arabic numerals, which are the numerals we use in, in uh, English. Um, the confusing thing about Eastern Arabic numerals is you read them from left to right, not right to left. So you read Arabic like this, you come to some numbers, you jump to the beginning of the numbers and you read them that way. Then you jump to the end of the numbers and then keep reading that way. Really confusing. Arabic is also caseless, so you don't have uppercase or lowercase. Um, <clears throat> they don't have italics. If you put Arabic into italics, they say to you, <coughs> what, what is this? So what are these scribbles on the page? <coughs> so an easy workaround for that is to override the I and the EM styles. Um, <coughs> a major issue we faced was with punctuation marks. Uh, so some of their marks are different, like this is an Arabic comma. Uh, an Arabic question mark but mostly they use the same punctuation marks uh, that we use in English <coughs> uh, and this causes problems 
I'll show you in a minute what they were. So to support right to left languages on the web, um, there are a few tools that you can use. Um, so there's the dear attribute, uh, which sets the direction of um, text inside an element. So here we're setting the whole of an HTML element to be right to left. So on the Arabic version of the Qatar Digital Library, the HTML tag contains that. Um, uh, and you can set it on, on any element. Um, so you can have uh, a website that's right to left and then a paragraph in it that reads left to right. Um, you have the same in CSS. So you've got a right to left, left to right in the direction property. Um, you also have this other rule, which is the Unicode by die. Um, <coughs> I won't go into it because it's kind of complicated. Um, briefly, Unicode um, has an algorithm which determines whether to display characters right to left to right or right to left. Um, and that's why uh, left to right and right to left scripts can be mostly supported on the web although not perfectly because the algorithm that Unicode uses isn't perfect. Um, Unicode also has left to right marks and right to left marks uh, and there are HTML equivalents. Um, so you put these before a character to, to specify where it should be placed. So we use these, actually I don't think we use them at all but we were tempted to use them. They're, they're very much a kind of last resort thing, if your text isn't displaying properly, if you've got English and Arabic on the same line um, and things are messing up, a last resort is to place markers to specify exactly where characters should go in the line. So we had a lot of problems with bidirectionality, um, which basically means having left to right and right to left scripts on the same line. So I'll show you an example. So this is a paragraph um, with some text in it. We're treating it as predominantly left to right, um, which is why it displays like this. So someone who can read in English and Arabic will come in and read this bit first. Then they'll jump to the end of here and read the Arabic that way and finish there. Um, Discs. This is an example of a shame. So below it we've got uh, the same example but we're treating it, a, it as predominantly right to left. So let's imagine that there's lots and lots of Arabic around it and this is just a bit of English and a sea of Arabic. So the bilingual speaker will come in see the English, jump to the beginning of it, read it that way, and then go back here and read the Arabic like that. Um, <coughs> and these, these display correctly, so that is correct and that is correct. The problem comes when you start putting punctuation marks in because they're ambiguous. Let's find my cursor. Is it possible to make that larger at all? Um, let's see. Yeah, Thank you. Okay. Okay, so if I put quote marks around English here, um, this, this is correct. Uh, this is displaying how we'd expect to see it. Some English with, with quote marks and then the Arabic which is untouched. So that's good. But if we do the same down here, uh, that displays incorrectly. So this quote mark here, we'd expect to see over there. Um, and this is the kind of fundamental problem with the Unicode bidirectional algorithm, is that these characters are ambiguous. It doesn't know how to treat them. It treats them based on their context. So the only way around this is to, sorry, my cursor is really hard to see, um, is to be more descriptive about your content. You basically have to wrap. Um, content to describe the direction of it in order to fix this. 
So that's fixed it because it now knows that this part is, is left to right and the punctuation should be treated as left to right and that this bit just inherits the rule from the P tag there. So the fix is basically to be more descriptive in your markup. Um, that can be a problem depending on where your content is coming from. We ingested a lot of content directly from the British Library. They gave us these massive XML files with all the translations in, um, and a lot of it was English and Arabic on the same line. Um, and as soon as we put it into the site, all the punctuation was in the wrong place. Um, and there were various things we had to do to, to kind of resolve that, and that the British Library had to do as well. Did you pre-process all the content before bringing it into Drupal then, or did you fix it in Drupal? Um, it was a mixture depending on uh, where the content was and how kind of um, whether we could take that piece of content out specifically. Uh, so actually, the British Library had to put in these Unicode markers themselves because there was no way of us telling which bit was English, which bit was Arabic. Um, so yeah. Um, so just finally, just a little bit about Drupal 8. Um, I mentioned it briefly before. So content translation is completely obsolete. There's no need for it. Um, it comes with entity translation out of the box, as I said, um, which means that there's much wider support for translation any entity is translatable. Um, and that's because there are kind of four core modules uh, to multilingual. It's, it's baked in a, a lot more closely with um, the system as a whole. Um, there's uh, the language module, which kind of deals with the concept of language within the site. Um, uh, there's all, all content has a language. There's no kind of undefined language on content. Um, which is really good, so you don't have to kind of deal with that. Uh, and then there is the content translation, interface translation, and config translation modules. Um, and they all work together to provide a much better system of, of um, building multilingual sites. Um, so if you go to Drupal 8 multilingual.org, there's loads of content there. It's where the discussion is being had about supporting multilingual sites in Drupal 8. Um, there's a really good video on the homepage which kind of outlines the problems in Drupal 7 and how they're dealing with it in Drupal 8. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to ask. Um, I'll put this link on here, but actually none of you can click on it and you probably don't want to write it down because it's really long, but I'm sure you'll be able to find it somewhere. Um, so yeah, if you've got any questions. Yeah, yeah just out of curiosity, are there any top to bottom languages left, or has the inter internet killed them all off? Because <laughs> <laughs> um, the traditional Chinese used to be, and Taiwan tried to keep it that way for a bit. But the, right. uh, the only web pages I've seen, they just where they've tried to be traditional, they've kept it. Um, they, they, do, they, they were just images, they cheated. Oh, but really? it, it kind of goes top to bottom, right to left. Yeah. <laughs> um, I doubt it because the directional um, attribute and property they only support left to right, right to left. Right, so there's no support for anything along those lines. It'll probably not. be impossible to implement it. Yeah, I think it'll be very hard. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately not. In terms of the project management of it, when you start a site that you know is going to be multilingual, mm -hmm. is it completely multilingual from the start? Or do they tend to like launch in one language and add the translation later? I'm asking because we've launched in English, but we've got a .fr and a .de domain, and all the all the entities are language neutral at the moment. Okay. So I think we're going to have a bit of a job at losing pages from the neutral translation to put them into French or German as we translate it up. Right. Um, so most of the sites we've got have been multilingual from the start, but the the Kubita collection, which um, I showed you at the beginning. Um, we built in English, and then a few months later they said we want it in, in Russian as well. Uh, so we basically plugged, plugged that um, uh, multilingual uh, support into it. Um, it wasn't too hard. Um, I actually did that, and yeah. It, yeah. And did they, were they able to 
launch, basically launch with a, basically a Russian domain where they're basically able to launch all of the, trans, the entire translation in one job lot, like as if it were a new site launch, rather than doing it in like, bits and pieces. Yeah, they, they launched it all at once. So we, we added the functionality and then said, okay, now you can add your translations. Mm -hmm. They added them all in unpublished and then published them all whenever they're ready. But this, yeah, this is exactly where I'm at. So if they, I don't know if this is the right question to ask. Um, so all of our content is neutral. We've got our, yeah. so it's in English, and their domain is English, and we've got a .fr and .de. As I understand it, as I as I add a translation in French, yeah. I have to take that node from neutral to English, English. to allow me to add French translation. Um, which means even if I leave that French one unpublished, the fact that the node is now in English means that won't be visible to anyone visiting their bar. Um, I'm not really? sure. I think with the language fallback, even though there's an unpublished one still fallback. Um, so you normally can configure if there isn't a translation. Published, yeah. If there isn't a translation for this language, fall back to, to this language. Yeah. So it says yeah. if there isn't a French one, fall back to the English one. But there would, I mean, I'm not sure because there is one. It's unpublished. It's just it's unpublished. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what happens here, if that's just a test yeah. to see. I think. Because I've just been having this conversation with like whether um, we just have to have a really intense month, like pl plan it out really carefully, yeah. all the bits of the interface, have all the content translation, have a French person ready to sit there and put it all on, yeah. and accept that for a month it's going to be a bit that, that, bad I mean, for the French customers who come to the FR domain, they're going to get missing pages and patchy bits and bobs until we get it live, or whether there's a way we can do it effectively like on a staging site, which I don't think there is because it's kind of content rather than yeah. Code. Um, so we launched it all at once by having a staging site and then kind of then set up the site there and we kind of then replaced the live site with what was the staging site. So there was nothing accessible on that second, on that Russian domain that wasn't like published, no one knew it existed basically until that whole translation. Yeah, I mean, we didn't have a Russian domain, we had computercollection.org slash RU, which right. suddenly became available when we launched the whole thing with all the content. I wonder if we've done it a bit back to front and having like that you can get to our site on the FR and the DE mm. and it just shows English content. So people probably will be going to, I don't know if it's indexed there to be fair, I don't know how many people actually visit those. Well, what you could do is is just launch the whole site, um, all of the, all the feature changes for multilingual support with all the content all at once and at the same time redirect your users from or, or kind of update the, the domain with whatever the new kind of multilingual domain is. So uh, example.de will suddenly point to uh, example.com slash fr, uh, yeah. uh, d, sorry. Because um, there's, the, there's the other stage of language detection, of how does the site yeah. know to show it in French? Yeah. So yeah. you can be going in, translating it all into French, and then it's only when you switch on the language detection That's exactly what I was thinking. to yeah. say if it's dot fr then it must be in French. Yeah. Otherwise it's going to show in English anyway. Or like yeah. if you draw or English. Yeah. yeah. And and there is the, the kind of fallback to English if there is no French. Um, yeah, that's useful. Which you could have that on and then publish all your content and turn it off. Um, yeah the next thing I'm going to ask is like if you've got some like master list of all the because from like, like from I mean marketing not development obviously and um, from, like from my point of view I was thinking that well, getting the actual content translation is quite a big job once the the ability to have translated notes is available so I've got that ability I can get the translation and as I was starting to add some in a few places I thought flip there's quite a lot of stuff on here that is translating on the interface yeah um, do you I mean how do you even like plan that out do you have to kind of go through and almost list out everything that needs yeah, so there's the localization update module which will download from localized. That's what you mentioned. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and it, you can import all of the contributed translations. There's loads of them. Uh, so French and German will you'll have like everything you need for the Drupal interface. Cool. And but I didn't know that thing you said about searching for the strings in the translate interface thing. I didn't know that it was case sensitive, which might be why I couldn't translate right, the okay. Chrome button I had <laughs> on my site the other day. So I should go back and look for it. Yeah. Case sensitive now. Yeah, it's really annoying. Um, yeah. One of the other gotchas with the translation space sometimes as well is that Drupal may not index things until you've used them 
So it's worth going into your site, making sure you've looked at it on the site, and then it will affect it with translation. Mm, yeah, that's, that's true. Mm. Irrespective of whether you put up a site map for the um, the FR and D domains, it's more so. It's more internal to Drupal than kind of search indexing. So okay. it's whether someone has visited that page and Drupal has, has seen us through. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's a bit, yeah, yeah. it's a bit intuitive sometimes. Mm. This is why the localization client is good because. You see the strings and then you see the interface, so it's already rendered the strings. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. That's useful. Okay. Yeah. The only one I would say is on the commerce on the products, I would definitely use entity translation on the product display because normally you would set your variant product variant field to not be translatable. Otherwise, what can happen is your because the nodes the content are different. Yeah. your product variation field could get out of sync. So if you had a new variant to add, you add it on your English version, it doesn't automatically add that on the French version with content translation. Yeah. Whereas if you're using entity translation, the product variant field isn't translatable. So when you add it, it's on everything. Okay. Yeah, Drupal Commerce is a good example where if you're using content translation, you might want to consider using entity translation as well, but just for that. Um, just for Drupal Commerce. No, 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 I'd say no, still not use content translation. Always stick with entity translation. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Can I ask you one more thing? <coughs> yeah, yeah, this is this is such a content side of things. You said something about if you're looking at your site in English and you hop onto say an English page, I click on the flag and flip it to my French translation. Mm. If I then put in a link uh, using the internal link dialog. Am I right in thinking that, although I'm editing a French page but logged into the English site, it would hyperlink to an English version rather than a French version um, or something? Is that, I think that's what you said. Yeah, uh, yeah. so. Because I have a bunch of random French hyperlinks in my English content and I don't know how they got there. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I didn't come across that problem with the link module because we weren't using it. Okay. Uh, I did on the NC reference, but I imagine that it's probably the same. Yeah. Where if you've got something which is searching your content, it will use the site language rather than the content language. Yeah, so I need to be careful to edit the French pages when logging into the French site. So what would you Yeah, or you can have like kind of say, give a give a more absolute link. So say, um, define slash fr slash node slash one or whatever instead of node slash one. Yeah. I'm not sure if I missed uh, the explanation. You mentioned early on that there was problems with case-sensitive translation, that you'd have the string, but it wouldn't translate if you changed a capital letter. And you said there's a workaround. Did you go on to mention what the workaround was? So this is in when you're in the interface translation range, and you're trying to find a string um, to translate. Uh, there's no, there, there wasn't one out there that I could find, so we built one for the localization client specifically not for the locale um, interface um, because it was easy, it's using JavaScript and it's just an easy thing to do. Um, so yeah, there's nothing kind of out there. Okay. But if you use the localization client, then it's kind of easy to create one yourself. Okay. Do you have anything to do with sound or speaking? Is there anything to do with that or is it just all text translation? Um, is there anything I know it's like Nothing I know of, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right. Uh, what, what kind of thing were you thinking of? So like well, I don't think it's something like voice recognition or, you know, sometimes you put a dictionary and you press the, the sound translation of a word. Right. Just the thinking about it with the dying languages, you could say the native speaker, well, I mean, the languages don't die themselves, but the native speaker as well. Right. So, might be an ethical thing behind it. Yeah. Not not that I know of, no. Yeah. Cool. Alright, well thanks a lot.